Well, today is Tuesday. November? No, it's not November. It's March. It's not March. It's not March. It's April. April 17th. Third time's the charm. And today we're doing uh, policy, social media, and security. This week is going to be a weird week for the news. It's probable that Friday's news will be pushed to Saturday because of some late-breaking other happenings that are scheduled for Friday. Because spontaneity is always scheduled, right? I mean, that's how that works. But it's going to be the same news quality, so don't worry about that. No, I don't. It's just zero? <laughs> the same level? I didn't zero? say what quality. <laughs> I said the same quality. Oh, we got a lot of follow-ups, too. We kind of we start with some follow-ups, and we also sprinkle some follow-ups in because, my goodness, there's a lot of follow-ups this week. All right. Our first follow-up this week is on the, uh, the founders of Backpage. Now, here in the U.S., something sort of weird and miraculous happened. We'll give you as a little bit of a backgrounder, and that is... We passed a law that said that if you run an online forum or like a classified ad site and people are using that for, you know, prostitution or whatever, that the owners of that site can be liable, which is contrary to all the other laws that we've had on the books for 20, 30 years. You know, it's interesting about this, though. They, they did not, that's not been signed yet, or at least it hadn't when they did this. So this is outside of FOSTA SESTA. They were already doing this. Hmm. And... Still, I, like, why don't you wait a week? Well, they and, did, <laughs> didn't they? I mean, FOSTA no, no, no. Said, this they mentioned in this article that they are not using FOSTA SESTA to. They went back and amended, uh, but they had already seized everything and arrested these guys uh, before that happened. So they've been charged with money laundering and aiding. Well, it's three guys, and one of the guys has already pled guilty. But it seems CEO. like it's it's part of a plea deal to go after the other two. Yeah, I think he is totally. Ratting on his bros. <laughs> if he has to go in for any amount of time, that's going to be real bad for him because it's in the news. Uh, the other funny, well, uh, funny, you know, a, a dark funny, is that they decided not to go forward with the pimping charges in this case. They only got him for, like, aiding prostitution or something like that. I can't wait to see how this case unfolds because, like, if they really were running a prostitution ring, okay. But if they were just hapless idiots running a communication site, then... Well, I think they knew what they were doing. Now, they did take some steps. They took out the... Uh, I can't remember what they called... I think it was called adult services. Oh, yeah. They had adult services section of the site. They took that out. But, of course, all the hookers just went to the personal section. Mm. And they kind of probably had to know that was happening. But, again, if you use a little bit of language to you know for subterfuge... Are you? Can you expect the website owner to, you know, get into all that and write out all your deceptions and stuff? Uh, I mean, even Craigslist. You know, Craigslist is a pretty not controversial company. It it may be as perhaps one of the least controversial because it's just so there's it's just text. There's there's nothing there. Like Craigslist's infrastructure is designed for like five people to be able to run the whole thing, and. Uh, Craigslist even pulled their personals. So I, no. there's, it's, it seems like there's at least some unintended side effects well, from this. Well, there were for sure hookers on Craigslist. I think we can say that yeah, know, yeah. safely. But there's probably hookers in your local newspaper, right? Like the escort services. That's a pretty thinly veiled... If you go to a major city and you go into you know a nice hotel, they're going to have a list of services and escort services are going to be in there. <laughs> Those are hookers. <laughs> so... I guess if they were doing all this before those laws passed, why did they need the new laws exactly? <laughs> to control the internet. <laughs> oh, there's my tinfoil hat. Uh, a U.S. judge has said that Uber drivers are not companies' employees. Now, this is sort of contrary to other similar rulings in like the EU where it has been said, hey, they are employees. And I think even like San Francisco, the city of San Francisco, I think was saying, no, 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 Uber drivers are Uber employees. But... Because the drivers are free to just work whenever they want and, you know, sort of do what they want between their assignments, the judge has ruled, well, they're not really employees for federal purposes. And this was just the limo drivers. The Uber's got, like, Uber limo, which I guess you own your own limo, which seems like it would be less of a, or it would be more of a professional thing to me. Like, limos are expensive. Like, yeah. Probably, like, hundred grand for a limo, seventy five grand. Yeah. Uh, but... The difference in the limo drivers is, for whatever reason, they did not have an arbitration clause in their contract with Uber. So they were able to sue directly, but they lost. 
Interesting. And that means they don't get health benefits and things like that. Another win for Uber this week was also with the FTC. The FTC has said that there are no fines for Uber over the 2016 data breach that we reported on. Uh, that's the one that they paid $100,000 to cover up, if you'll recall. And, and we covered that We covered that pretty extensively when it happened. But the FTC has concluded its investigation and said, well, we're going to keep an eye on their privacy audit logs, but we're not going to fine them or otherwise punish them. And this was the second time they had had a previous breach. And so the FTC rules, they actually have some constraints on what they can do. On a first time, they're not allowed to do much of anything except warn and basically what they did here. But on the second offense, they should be able to do more, but they've chosen not to. Interesting. So this is the FTC that is going to be expected to go after ISPs when ISPs run afoul of net neutrality as well. So the very <laughs> same agency. Surely that won't end badly. And we should remind everybody that this was under the previous CEO. Was it Kaplanik or Kalanick or something like that? Who everybody hates, and he was the one accused of... Uh, you know, being against women and sexually harassing them and everything. And he demonstrably went to great lengths to cover this up. <laughs> so despite all that, the FTC doesn't seem to care. <laughs> Was that wrong? Should I not have done that? <laughs> That's probably, I don't know. He didn't even tell the next CEO. That was <laughs> yeah. the hilarious thing about it. <laughs> he didn't tell anybody. <laughs> no one needs to know about this. This can be our little secret because otherwise people will freak out. Their data's not worth anything. No one cares. I mean, we're going to have the Equifax breach and no one's going to care about that. Well, so. that, that was in the shadow of the Equifax breach. And I think maybe that's what saved them or one of the things. <laughs> well, if we punish Equifax, we'd have to punish Uber and we're not going to punish. Okay. Yeah. The, God, everything's so messed up over here. Tesla has been booted from an investigation into the fatal autopilot crash. Now, it's really interesting because the NTSB, that's their National Traffic Safety Board, has said that Uber has been booted. But Uber has saying, well, we, we stepped away from the investigation because we wanted to report on what we're finding on, in the investigation as we find it. But the NTSB has a problem with that. So it seems like, a little bit like he said, she said. But the NTSB has a policy that... You don't say anything about it until the end, because obviously what you say about it could be damaging to court cases and businesses and things like that. So you really have to wait till you figure everything out. They haven't figured anything out. So Tesla was kind of, you know, getting out there and tweeting. It's like, oh, it wasn't our fault. <laughs> uh, yep. Totally driver error. <laughs> and the NTSB was not cool with that. I <laughs> uh, can't imagine why Tesla would ever want to do that to just to make people, you know, it's like, yeah. And this was the, uh, they've already settled the civil, right? They settled yeah. with the family. It's the guy that uh, didn't have his hands on the wheel and hit the divider. Well, it's even weirder than that. They've made a, Tesla's made a lot of, in my opinion, very strange statements around that. Things like, well, when we met with the family, we talked to them about, you know, the victim's thoughts on autopilot. And it's like, did the victim misunderstand how autopilot works? And so Tesla is saying what the family said, which is, oh, no, he totally understood that the autopilot didn't work and that in this one particular area where the fatal crash occurred, that it was known to be unreliable and the data showed that his hands was not on the wheel for like six seconds. And so the family is like, yeah, I don't know, but it well, seems weird. Did they say that before or after they saw the zeros on that check? Uh, that was after. Yeah, so. That was definitely mm, after. Yeah, maybe I might say that too. <laughs> Now, last week we reported on the whole Sinclair thing, and if you haven't seen the video of this, you really got to check it out. There's a video on YouTube of a whole bunch of TV stations, over 100. 200. 200, saying the same exact thing and the same exact cadence with all their little local anchors, and it's because they're all owned by Sinclair Broadcasting. And they're talking about fake news and how important it is to get real news from Sinclair-owned stations. So a bunch of senators asked the FCC to look into this because, historically, that's something the FCC has dealt with when people are abusing airwaves things. And of course, that's, that's a Jeep pie. That's our old buddy, a Jeep pie. You'll remember him from last week as the hardest working man in corruption. And he responds very, very oddly to this. Yeah. He's pulling the old first amendment thing, which well, that's, they, you know, they whip that out a lot. And of course, you know, there is a part of me that thinks, uh, if you own something, you do what you want with it. But when it comes to calling yourself news and, you know, having this monopolistic control over all these little news organizations, maybe, maybe not, you know, because you do have to think. Now, the, but the deal breaker for me is 
These people revealed, all these news broadcasters, after they were you know, derided in public and on Twitter for this, they didn't have a choice, and they were actually threatened that if they even talk about this, they might be fired. And if you get fired or you quit from Sinclair, you have to pay them. <laughs> so all those things together is really disgusting, and yeah, I think maybe the FCC should look into that. Yeah, it seems like somebody should look into something. It seems like lawmakers, as as disconnected as they are, we'll find out more about that in a later program. Well, the other thing about this argument, he he shapes it as just because they say something you don't like, you're not allowed to go after them with the FCC. But that's not what's happening here. They're saying something they don't like. With a gun to their head, essentially, you know, a financial gun. A so, journalist with quotation marks around it. Yeah, so it's not genuine, his, his argument here. I can't imagine someone would have disingenuous arguments as the head of the FCC. <laughs> <laughs> How could this happen? I mean, it's like when you can't win the one argument, argue something else and hope everyone's distracted. That's called it? a straw man. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> Uh, switching gears, we reported that uh, Foxconn is coming to America. Foxconn's going to develop a really amazing factory. That was the, one of the big Trump wins. You know, he's bringing manufacturing back to America to support the little people. <laughs> We're getting a lot of angry reports from those little people. They're they're very upset about <laughs> some of the happenings that are going into this. So, Belt Magazine brings us a story about the site where the factory is going to be constructed. Apparently, they're going to use eminent domain to seize a bunch of people's houses, but in order to do that, they have to mark the houses as blighted because the people don't want to sell. But the houses are not in any way blighted. Yeah, you think about the term blighted, and uh, you know it conjures some extreme imagery. Right? Yeah. You think of and plants, you know, it's like diseased beyond repair. Well, they don't. There was a, a lawyer here. There's like a pro bono law law firm that's jumping in here, and it's like, oh yeah, we know all about this. They've done this before. And they don't talk about every requirement for blighted, but one requirement for blighted is you have to have 50% higher crime rate yes. than the surrounding counties. And that's just not the case here. This is just this a, is so rural. It's a little farm country with, you know, like low population density, just rolling beautiful farmland, cows and horses. It's idyllic <laughs> in a lot of ways. And they're saying that it's blighted and they're basically just scraping up the land. A lot of people are holding out for a better offer, but some people, including there's one couple that has a brand new home that's less than a year old, and they've never actually gotten an offer on what exactly their home is worth. Now, you know, eminent domain for progress, okay, fine. Uh, in situations like this, you probably should pay the homeowners, you know, 20% above market value, maybe as much as 50% above market value. As a taxpayer, I, think, I would support that. I think 140% is, so, you know, 40% above market value is the norm. But they haven't gotten offers. But they also talked about how working farmland, which is not residential and can't be blighted, was getting 500% hmm. in all of those cases in the, in the same area. So I would be really, really suspect about the uh, misuse of the terminology here. Another thing in Wisconsin law, apparently, is that one of the conditions for being blighted is that the blighted area is not going to be immediately conveyed to a commercial interest. Yeah, yeah, or a private like interest, a year or something like that. Which it's not even. It's going to be like a week because <laughs> they want to get started as soon as possible. <laughs> they also had one lady who had filed for, uh, you know, you have to get some sort of permit or something to completely renovate her home, and they approved it like a month ago, knowing damn well <laughs> that this was going to happen. <laughs> That doesn't seem exactly honest. That seems like that lady should maybe be in that 500% bracket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not good. China, we always like reporting on China, right? Because China has removed four news apps from their smartphone, uh, from smartphone stores. Or they've asked smartphone stores like the Apple Store and the Google Play Store to remove news apps. And one of the surprising things about this is Tencent uh, is makers of one of the apps. Yeah, and... It's not necessarily, I think most of these are just news aggregation apps. Yeah. They're not, it's not, it's not like uh, InfoWars. <laughs> the Tiananmen Square update app. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not something that, I don't think it's particularly partisan or incendiary or anything. It's just not, I think it's pulling in stories, foreign stories and stuff like that. They just simply don't want there. They don't have control of it. So they've yanked it. Although I think, you know, you mentioned Apple. I think the Apple store is the only one that hadn't complied at this point. Hmm. That's interesting, considering that Apple is the one that com one of the ones that complied early 
with the uh, VPN applications. I mean, Apple pulled a lot of VPN applications at the request of the Chinese government. So it, it might just be the the bureaucracy of Apple takes a long time to get things done. Oh, we we love reporting on things in India because India is working on that whole global national biometric database and things sort of go wrong with that. We've got a pretty good article here from the New York Times. We're, we're unfortunately out of free articles. We've got it open and incognito. <laughs> yeah. You can't see that. But you can yourself, when you look at the one tab, open it in incognito. You will always beat the paywall. Pro tip. <laughs> a pro criminal tip? Is that criminal? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. But a Big Brother in India requires fingerprint scans for food, phones, and finances. They've got some quotes in here from the people and they're just like, this is an unnecessary headache. This is worse than it was before. Why do we have to do this? Yeah, the, the I, I can't pronounce the name of the thing. It translates into foundation. The foundation program is retina scans and fingerprints, and that ties into everything. It ties into your credit card, your entitlements, your school, your travel, because they have a lot of public transportation in India. You can't get on public transportation unless you scan your fingerprint, stuff like that. So it's not only Orwellian. You know what's funny is they mentioned in that article, the term big brother in India, the translation is when somebody like, like if you're broken down on the side of the road and a good Samaritan stops to help you, you refer to them as big brother. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a good thing in their terminology. But yeah, a lot of people are complaining. Now here's the crazy part. You think about the super technologically advanced biometric retina scans and thumbprints and some of the people who are being negatively affected are the leprosy victims. <laughs> so the, the same country that has all of this amazing technology still has a huge problem with leprosy. There's a disconnect there. <laughs> this is only a technology news program. How are we expected to solve the world's <laughs> problems? The other problem is it's, it's such an agrarian economy outside of the cities that people, you know, you know working your fingers to the bone, they're literally doing that in such a way that also their fingerprints are not recognizable from month to month. That's the thing. That's a that's a legit thing with farmers and stuff. Just because yeah, you use right. your hands a lot, yeah. just your fingerprints wear off. I mean, so they they estimated as much as twenty percent of people who previously got some kind of entitlement are now just simply unable to get it. <laughs> Which I guess that's big savings if you're the government, right? Well, here we would probably accuse business owners that do that of trying to line their pockets by making it more difficult for the entitled ease to collect whatever it is that they're entitled to. Well, this is purely through the government, though. So, so local to the local. Is it like the sheriff that we had where the sheriff was running the inmate program? He gets to pocket the money. <laughs> like the local politicians get to pocket the money that's there? That's a good question. I don't know if they get... If each munis municipality gets like a stipend or... <laughs> it's like, hey, we didn't use all the entitlement budget. We'll just roll that into the equipment budget. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when they were talking about doing away with cash. What happened was the black market sort of stepped in. Uh -huh. And people would still get something, but it would be less. And then somebody else was siphoning off a lot. So I'll be uh, curious to know what, uh, from anybody that's there, I think we've got a few people in, in the audience that, that are there sort of experiencing this. I'd be, I'd be curious to know how that is. We've, we've had an interesting dichotomy in the comments on this over the years, because, you know, I remember when we first reported on this and they were like, no, this is a good thing. It's totally not going to be abused. And we're like, it's going to be abused in this way. And then fast forward six months and it was abused in exactly the way that we predicted. The other thing is they reported on one woman and she was, you know, like the perfect candidate for, this thing. She was middle class, young, and totally following all the rules. But we talk about how this is so, it's such an optimistic program that meets the reality of these little rural municipi municipalities. She, she had to go, I think, four different times, <laughs> and it failed the first three times. So then she would have to schedule another one, wait in line again, and it was just failure to upload. So she would go through like the scanning process, and it's like, sorry, it didn't upload. So she'd go and try to get her whatever with her fingerprint. They're like, no, you don't exist. Wow, that sounds like voter disenfranchisement here. It's like, well, I'm sorry, no. you can't vote today because whatever. <laughs> because reasons. Uh, other bad news for technology people. Trump proposes rejoining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, there's lots and lots of aspects of this that are negative that have nothing to do with technology. But the technology aspect of it, which is what we care about on this channel... Uh, means that this is probably going to make the trade wars thing worse, not better, 
I would think, because we're doing the whole China trade wars thing, so importing electronics may start to get sketchy here in America. And I think that uh, Trump is hoping that some negotiation here will result in more favorable trade deals from like Japan. But I just, I think this is going to be bad. Well, we've got the tariffs, of course, and that's become kind of a mess because they've turned right around and put tariffs on our corn and soybeans, which like we, we can, we probably will buy the technology. I mean, you think the, the we can't I, not the iPhone owners, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they'll feel better about themselves when that iPhone costs $2,000. <laughs> but if it makes more sense to buy the corn and soybeans from somebody else, then what are we going to do with it? Those farmers cannot sell it locally. We are biodiesel. Yeah, we're up to our ears in corn in America. You know, <laughs> we have too much, so you have to sell it to somebody. But the other thing about this is Trump. One of his campaign promises was get, to get out of this. This is one of his campaign promises that he immediately. Remember when they rolled out all those? It was like here are six things that Trump has done that he promised in the first quarter of his first year or whatever. This was one of those things. But it, it seems like he very quickly changed his mind on it. Like he got in a room with some people and they were like, you should have never left the TPP. And he was like, you're right. We should go back. <laughs> like, How do you change your mind that quickly? Uh, it's The TPP I see is a win for copyright owner, owners and drugs. It's like you can copyright and patent drugs. And there are a lot of drugs that should have entered the public domain a long time ago. But for whatever reason, manufacturers won't manufacture them or there are trade deals like this that prevent their manufacture. It's a very subtle and nuanced, complicated situation, no matter how you cut the cheese. And I think that it's ultimately bad for the population, but good for business, which is oh, yeah. still probably bad for the population. And it's bad for those. He was talking to a small amount of farmers who export most of their crops. And yeah, it's bad for them because, again, they're selling everything to China and Japan and places like that. But to be so quickly swayed, although, you know, of course, the other story this week, which we don't cover here because it's not really technology, but he also changed his mind on that whole Syria thing pretty quickly. <laughs> wah, wah. You know what else he changed his mind about? The Postal Service. So uh, an audit of the Postal Service has been ordered after suggesting that Amazon is to blame for its troubles. What's really funny is that that audit was already done a few years ago. And the reason that the Postal Service is having trouble financially is because it's the only organization in America that is required to pre-fund its retirees health benefits. And from time to time, the government will go into that piggy bank and use that money for other reasons. That's yes. the big problem. Now, of course we look at our, uh, you know, teacher, fireman, policeman, <laughs> pension systems, maybe not a terrible idea to pre-fund those because they're in bad shape. But to give that as an interest-free loan to the government when it needs it, terrible idea. Yeah, that has not really worked out so far. I mean, the other programs that we have that have been tapped for things like that, the other social programs that we have, other than, you know, the Postal Service's retirement benefits, uh, there are other programs in the U.S. government that, that are not, they're kind of pre-funded, at least the money is collected, but then we end up using the money for other things, and by the time it rolls around that the money's needed, especially in times of economic downturn, the money's not really there. So this is just that on another larger scale. So yeah. this is just, uh, it's it, it, it would be amazing if the report comes in and it's like, yeah, we should ask the Postal Service to operate like any other company with regard to how they fund stuff. It's financial problems would go away. It would actually be making money hand over fist. Still probably not a bad idea to pre-fund it, but... This is just, it's, this level of dishonesty is just, it's <laughs> well, just baffling. It's, I think you, you, if you really look at it, yeah, okay, Postal, Postal Service probably got some problems. Now, if, you, if we really sit down and we look at all the numbers and stuff, yeah, it probably has some problems. On a list of most important problems in America, <laughs> that's around number 8,576. <laughs> I'm just going to guess. Somewhere in that neighborhood. <laughs> The EFF did a write-up this week on some recent happenings in D.C. Not just one case, but a couple of cases, actually. But a D.C. court has ruled that accessing public information is not a computer crime. And this is really, really important in the context of, kind of in the context of old cases like Aaron Schwartz. But specifically in this case, um, where someone had uh, automated downloading Java without the McAfee malware toolbar pop-up whatever. Um, and also da automating downloading some information from public websites. You know, in the terms of use, it says, don't do that. 
And so some districts have said that is a computer crime if you do something on a website that is against the website's terms of service. But a DC court has said, nope, that's not, we're not going to interpret it that way because that opens Pandora's box. That's, uh, remember the LexisNexis one? That was a big one. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, you said the Oracle one. That was it. Now, you know what this could apply to is Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. Because uh, do you call that public information? <laughs> it was on a website they had access to. It's a it's a terms of service violation with Facebook. Facebook keeps referring to it as a contract, and it's like, is there enough stuff to execute well, that no. as a contract? They this this ruling. I don't know if it came out and said it, but in the when they were interpreting, they were like, nobody reads the terms of service, and you can't make up your own laws in a terms of service and expect those to be enforced by the government. Yeah. Yeah, up to this point, websites could say you violated their terms of service. That is a criminal act, and it's like, whoa, that should be a misdemeanor at worst. So there's a rare for those of all of you who are like, man, this show's okay, but it sure does depress me. There's a little silver lining for you. You know, when the good things happen, we cover them. They just don't happen very often. We've got another another silver lining for you, and that's Google has won and lost a right to be forgotten case. So. The headline for the BBC is Google has lost the right to be forgotten case. There were actually two cases. Google won one and lost one. The one that they won was uh, someone who'd committed a fairly serious crime and served like six years in prison. Right. And so the, that person would like those records expunged from Google. They lost. Uh, somebody else was, was spent like six months in jail or three months in jail for a relatively minor offense. That person won and Google will have to expunge search results for that individual. But that's... I think that's terrible because it doesn't set any sort of case law. But what it does do is say you have to go to court if you want this to happen. And a judge has to decide. The judge said part of his ruling was because one guy showed remorse. Hmm. Is that that shouldn't be a factor. <laughs> so what this does is it creates a situation where, OK, you can you have the right to be forgotten. If you if you're rich enough and influential enough to sue Google and <laughs> see it to the end, and you have the courts in your pocket, it seems like that would turn into a Streisand effect really quickly, though, for the rich and famous. Because like you know, if Britney Spears went to jail for doing cocaine or whatever, and then she was suing Google to have that expunged, it seems like that would just be in the news all over again. Mm, that's probably true. But this guy, you know, the the, the winner. We don't know his name. We don't know what he did. I, I didn't bother to look it up. I thought that was remarkably responsible of the BBC because here in America we would have been like, they wanted the guy to remain anonymous, <laughs> but his home address is this, and you can search for that home address and see everyone that's ever lived there, and it's just like, oh. I, but I don't know. We certainly in this country, you know, you've got the, uh, it's so much fun to look at the the criminal databases and see the mugshots <laughs> and everything. So we kind of go with the idea that like, okay, yeah, you're a criminal, People need to know what you did. And we're going to nail this up on the cathedral door on Sunday. <laughs> and uh, this, this goes against that. I'm not sure if... I don't know. I like the idea of, you know, once you've done the time for the crime, that that's it and it's over and you need to move on. But at the same time, there are definitely patterns of behavior. And so it's like if you've done a series of crimes and done the series of time for those crimes... That probably should still be in the public record. But again, you're creating this crazy set of rules that yeah. Google can never adhere to. Yeah. So It would have to go through a court system in order for somebody to suss out the specific situation because but that's, we, that's we, so much work. I mean, people are already waiting you know, for, for civil cases or yeah. even they're waiting in jail for two years to get a criminal case heard. <laughs> we don't need more court cases. So maybe what you're saying is we should change this as a society. And it's like, yep, dude was totally having a bad day. He was arrested for drunk and disorderly. Eh, we all have bad days. It's fine. Let's move on. Uh, I guess it was what he was doing. <laughs> if he was driving, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you make up your own mind. It's It should not be so... Stigmatic, I guess, would be would be as a society we need to not stigmatize those people so bad because like some convicted felons are genuinely trying to do really good when they get out. To, like, but uh, also, around. those guys are in the UK, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's not even it's not really the same. It's apples and oranges. Dubai is launching a digital vehicle number plate. Now, this I was like, okay, cool. It's going to be like a QR code that can be read by machines automatically. Nope. <laughs> it's an electronic plate that tracks you at all times. And literally the number can change. So <laughs> the cr it's, it's so Orwellian the more you get into it. So not only can they 
disable it. So like if you don't pay your registration or whatever, I just turn your number off. Literally, your number will go away. <laughs> and but the other thing is they automatically deduct the fees. So if you get a traffic fine, you might find out about it when you see the debit from your account because <laughs> your license plate is tied to your bank account. Think about how crazy that is. Uh how, how amazing is that going to be in the future where you, like, you just drive around the city and it's like, oh, this drive today cost me $50. I had no idea I was going through a construction zone. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's just a trial version. But if they figure out that it's cost effective, and I guess it will be when they start fining everybody for every little thing, they're going to roll it out to the entire country. <laughs> now, Mark Zuckerberg has been in the news a bunch. We've covered him to death. And there's a lot more news this week on, on Zuckerberg. But we're that's not really... So many good memes. <laughs> so many. We're not really going to... I mean, I feel like everything has been covered. We're not really going to rehash it. If you want to check that out, last week's news episode was No Luck for the Zuck. You should check that out because we basically covered everything. That was before his congressional testimony. Since then, there are a couple of things that we'll highlight. Uh, some Facebook employees are reportedly uh, quitting or asking to switch departments over ethical concerns. So, this, you know... The headline, you could paint a lot of pictures with this, but there are a lot of employees that are sort of saying, well, you know, we might have raised some flags internally. We're going to just sort of migrate over here. Yeah, they talk about uh, the the buzzword, the, the one that everybody's tweeting about, is the golden handcuffs. Because... <laughs> what are you supposed to do? They talk to these people, and it's like, yeah, I kind of know that we're evil, but... You, you have no idea how easy this job is and how much I get paid. <laughs> so I don't really want to walk away from this. Uh, some of them have wanted to go to Instagram and some of the other Facebook-owned things. But, you know, I think the when you read between the lines in that article, they all knew what was going on. Yeah. I, I don't think you... Um, if you're working in a technical aspect, you know, we've talked about this before, where sometimes people will hire you to work on their website and they don't understand it's like once you have access to the database you have everything like, you can't there is no privacy at that point you can get whatever you want and if you're working at that level of course you knew what was happening at facebook and i think what really riled them up is the fact that they found out it got trump elected or you know supposedly <laughs> Allegedly. So. they imagined that it did whether and then so the, now they're outraged and they're they're leaving <laughs> that's so offensive i don't understand uh, Zuck testified with the Senate uh, to the Senate and the Democrats proposed a tough opt-in privacy law. This is a pretty good summary of that, but you really should go check out the video because there are some amazing, amazing clips of that. Um, and I, the news itself is not like it was a grilling. I mean, you know, Zuckerberg is testifying and answering questions. And the news is not really like as anybody watching this program, I, I don't think they're going to get a lot out of it. Technologically speaking, Zuckerberg basically had a few canned answers. Well, a lot of canned answers. But the questions that a lot of senators were reading to him, they really struggled with. Like, the more disturbing thing here is that the senators, even with all the, I don't know, what would you call it, conditioning, training, ahead of this questioning in the world, they still got some basic fundamental stuff so wrong. <laughs> well, I... Diane Feinstein was my favorite one. <laughs> she could barely sound out the words. It's clear <laughs> she had never seen some of those words before. She had no concept of what she, was going on. I don't think it would be unfair to say that she was not literate. <laughs> and, you know, she wasn't the only one. She's easy to make fun of because she's, you know, not literate. she's low functioning. <laughs> but there were a lot of those people on that panel that were uh, clearly. The people sitting behind them knew what was going on because they wrote those questions. <laughs> but the people presenting the questions. And there was one guy who he brought up the whole uh, logged out. Oh, yeah, logged out ad logged tracking. Logged out tracking. Yeah. And that was just brushed under the rug. Zuckerberg was like, mm, don't know anything about that. Let's follow up. <laughs> and there was one guy who brought up the Obama campaign. Yeah. Uh, doing the exact same thing as Cambridge Analytica. Again, that guy, actually, if you go back and listen to that testimony, he's like, you know, Obama did this. I'm not going to ask you to, to talk about that right now. Like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so so yeah, maybe they did uh, understand. Maybe it was clear to them exactly what was happening. I don't know. But it, it, was, a, it was a dog and pony show. Yeah. I had, the bigger problem here, I think, would be trying to educate these lawmakers. I was also really disappointed with the, the age distribution. It was definitely skewed way up there well that's just our leaders i mean i don't is it is it ageist to say 
hey, maybe the part of the reason that these guys just don't get it is because, you know, are they, it's, it, it, I was actually kind of hopeful, more hope, I mean, it was definitely a dog and pony show, don't get, don't get me wrong, and I am an overly optimistic by nature, but it seemed like some of the people up there were genuinely trying to comprehend the gravity of the situation in terms of access to data and how bad things are and, you know, potentially the potential for abuse. It was start, like I could see sort of the glimmers of a flicker of maybe, oh, we this thing is being built and there's not really anything to stop it. And it could be abused commercially for really, really evil ends. And I'm not saying that Facebook is doing that, but... Uh, the machinery is being built and someone will abuse it. And it seemed like some of the people were starting to get clued into that, but the fundamental <laughs> misunderstanding of technology was just so severe that the signal to noise ratio, I don't think was high enough there that anybody could effectively do anything about it. I think it's, it was just them, you know, they're trying to, they're always thinking about their reelection. That's the problem. I'll give you a great example. If you go back and you watch the entire Senate, there was one, I don't know what her name is, but there was one person who asked, about uh, ICE, Immigration and Customs. And she had this theory that ICE was going to start using social media to... They are. Uh, to you know, go after illegals and stuff like that. And of course, Zuckerberg was like, well, nobody's, I haven't heard, nobody's contacted me about that. Which is probably true. They probably haven't talked to him about it. And she just kept going on and on about this thing that has nothing to do with the Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> she was just soapboxing, you know. And this is, a lot of those people, they're just getting up there... They're saying what they think the people want to hear. Yeah. And they're trying to present themselves as a certain kind of thing. And nothing really ever gets done. No. Uh, it apparently had a pretty good effect on America. So nearly one in ten Americans have deleted their Facebook accounts, according to a survey. Well, it was a third survey of a thousand people. So, so how yeah. accurate can it really be? If it's really 10%, I mean, i got to imagine things inside of Facebook have got to be sort of Harry Carey levels of crazy. Yeah. I... I you know, the whole correlation of the small numbers, but yeah, if it is that many people, they have to be scrambling <laughs> because How can we get them back. You know, they've got all that R and D and all those acquisitions, behavioral modification programs. That's not going to pay off if they lose their people. But more importantly, they're going to have to step really carefully in terms of selling data. You know what sounds like a really amazing way for Facebook to deflect responsibility a paid see something say something program where literally if you find there, there's an app and it's like oh you report an app and it may be abused we'll investigate as facebook and if they are uh if they are abusing you could win 500 to ten thousand dollars i think it's just forty thousand is it 40 i thought it was 500 to 10 no no it's like what's the minimum impact needed to be rewarded oh ten thousand more facebook users it's the how much can i expect to make forty thousand dollars upwards of forty thousand dollars that one, not below, end of that one, oh, down yeah. one, down one, oh. end of that one. Oh yeah. Oh wow, forty thousand. Damn. But a minimum of five hundred. Yeah. I I know an app I could report. <laughs> I know about ten. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what they're saying here is, is like you say, it's kind of like uh, you know, oh, just point it out, just rat somebody out, and we'll give you forty grand. And <laughs> but I don't. You would have to be probably working on the app. Yeah. Something like the Cambridge Analytica, a user of that app would have had no idea. No. So. No clue. Um, Instagram, which is also a Facebook thing, right? I mean, Facebook owns Instagram mm -hmm. or whatever. Face Instagram has announced that they're going to let you download your content after criticism about portability. And this has been the case with Instagram even before Facebook bought them. Is they're designed to make it as hard as possible for you to get your data out of Instagram to, because... If you just have a bunch of photos, it turns out there's hundreds of services online you can just upload a bunch of photos to. Big deal. Yeah, so basically they're going to give you a way to download all the photos you've uploaded to Instagram. It's about time. And yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's hard to praise them for it because <laughs> it seems like basic functionality. But I guess that's a good step. Yeah. Twitter also wants in on the act because they have announced that they are going to comply with the Honest Ads Act to combat Russia social media meddling. Now, the Honest Ads Act is not law yet, but Twitter is going to say, yeah, we, we can get behind this. We're going to go ahead and implement this. So this basically just means if you see an ad, you can find out who bought it and, you know, if it's, who's saying it, what's going on behind it and that kind of thing. So I bet, uh, you know, political campaigns are upset about that. 
<laughs> I think that uh, I think there, there are going to be a lot of media companies that are upset about that. I think we're going to see a lot of shell companies come into <laughs> existence. But isn't I think that Honest Ads Act is built to combat that as well. Like yeah, because you, you have to register with them. Yeah. yeah, that's what Facebook is doing as well. Zuckerberg repeated that many many times in his testimony. But the the more dangerous, I think the far more dangerous situation, especially in the climate of the changes that the FCC has made to net neutrality and data privacy at the ISP level, Facebook, at least from the beginning, has been pretty honest and pretty transparent about what they intend to do with your data if you were paying attention to that kind of thing. Now, the vast majority of the population not really paying attention to that. Our lawmakers not paying attention to that. But the in the same cautions that we gave you, at least, and I think that a lot of other people in the know with technology gave you, I think the much, much, much more dangerous situation is collusion with companies like Yahoo and AOL and Verizon. So they're getting together to be able to read your emails and do stuff with your content. And so even if you're using a VPN, if you're using Yahoo or AOL, it would not matter because your providers are going to get access to your data directly from the service provider in order to mine your habits and build profiles exactly like Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, and this is not anything new. Of course, Google did this up until sometime in 2017, I think. Yeah. Uh, the AdWords would parse through your email and try to find things to, that you like to advertise to you with. And Yahoo's saying that's exactly what they're going to start doing. They've done it before too, I think, and stopped, but yep. now they're back into it. Yeah, the, uh, there are changes to OAuth or oath with the or oath that's the parent company oath oath privacy not oath oath uh privacy uh policy and the changes there i think this is going to fly under the radar until something like cambridge analytica happens and maybe they'll be careful enough with the data that something like cambridge analytica doesn't happen but you can better believe that they're going to exploit the data more than cambridge analytica ever did well it's not a public profile in any sense but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be a leak you know, this probably be more of an Equifax tragedy than a Cambridge Analytica tragedy. Well, it doesn't matter that it's not a public profile because, well, there's two darker aspects of this. One is that they're allowed to do this. The FCC has explicitly said this kind of thing is completely okay for an ISP to include in its terms of service. The second really disturbing thing is that when we have things like the Cloud Act, the standard that the government could use to obtain this data is extremely, extremely low. So... If, you know, for whatever reason you were being surveilled or the government wanted information on you, they could just simply request the profile that has been built for you in these systems. And I think it would otherwise, it's, you couldn't otherwise do it, at least under the U.S. Constitution, because it would be an unreasonable search. But if it's happening in a commercial company, then it's not really, the search is not unreasonable because the information was already given to a third party. And so that changes the equation a little bit. And that's that's the really scary thing we got to be careful of. But this, when we talk about the Facebook stuff, I think it applies here too. If you ever thought your Yahoo Mail was not subject to whatever Yahoo wanted to do with it, including law enforcement, <laughs> you shouldn't be. No, oh, don't use Yahoo. Don't use Yahoo Mail. That's for spam. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't realize that in the way that a lot of people did not realize what they were giving Facebook. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> data, data. This one is a fun security article. This is really one of one of just a couple of pure security articles. But data exfiltration over a PC power supply. Yeah. So if you're at the electrical service panel, you can send about ten bits per second from a computer over the power connection with no extra special hardware or anything like that just by encoding it into how much power idle cores in the CPU use. I think it was 100 at the panel, 1,000 if you could put the clamp directly on the power cable. <laughs> so what they're doing is they're taking unused cores in the CPU and with the software, they're spinning them up, which is going to affect the power load in a predictable way. And if they're listening on the other end, then they can, of course, you just in binary, they can <laughs> send data over the power cable to the switch, which is incredible. It's a, it's a low enough bit rate that, to be super annoying. I mean, intelligence agencies would definitely use this to recover your private keys, but yeah. that's about it. Uh, it's too slow for, for anything else, really. Although, you know, over time, I'm sure they could. Uh, yeah. I mean, if, you, or if you're talking about... A, a CPU that's got 12 cores. Yeah. 
then maybe they could use three most of the time, you know, and you triple the speed. That explains my performance anomaly. Oh, they've already compromised the system. Yeah. Speaking of people that have already compromised the system, uh, <laughs> we've reported on this before, but there was a guy who was arrested for swatting. and This is the Kansas guy, right? This is the guy that got the guy killed. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So. Right. So, yeah, he... Uh, we'll, we'll rehash it. He was playing Call of Duty. Of course he was. Look at him. Of course he was playing Call of Duty. <laughs> and somebody was trash talking him and he was like, oh yeah, where do you live? And that guy just made up an address. Well, it turns out that was a real address. This guy swatted that address and the homeowner who knew nothing about this situation, had no idea what was going on, was killed by the SWAT team in his front door. So this guy is awaiting sentencing. That's the crazy thing here. His case has not been settled. He has yet to be sentenced for his crimes and he did the stupidest thing in the world. And that thing was, he posted to Twitter, how am I on the internet if I'm in jail? Oh, it's because I'm an e-god. That's how. 9.05 a.m. on Twitter on Friday. The Twitter handle, here's the thing. It's like, blah, blah, blah. 19 minutes later, the same handle said, all right, now who's uh, who's talking crap or whatever? Your, your, your ass, I guess, is about to get swatted. So, yeah. Yeah, he threatened to do the same crime <laughs> while awaiting sentencing. Now, he is not, in fact, an e-god. What happened was they have these uh, kiosks in jails these days. So you have phone calls and commissary and you have all these ways that you can spend money in jail because they're for profit. And you put you punch in your, your uh, prisoner number and that's your way of buying all these things. So they have these electronic kiosks that facilitate all of that. Well, somebody did an update on one of them and left the internet Wi-Fi turned on or something. <laughs> I guess it wasn't Wi-Fi. I guess it was the kiosk itself. Like, they gave him browser access or something. I don't know. But anyway, the prisoners immediately discovered the flaw and began using the internet. Yeah, the internet. Woo! No. It'll be interesting to see what happens at his trial. I'm, gonna, I'm sure at his sentencing. I'm sure that, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that we will be reporting on that. Yeah, and you got to think that will be construed as a threat. Yeah. I mean, pretty credible, considering what he's done. And he will be charged with... Uh, if if there is any justice, <laughs> he will be charged with additional crimes based on this. One can only hope. And with that, we will see you tomorrow in tomorrow's news, which is going to be business news, crypto. I don't remember how we broke it up. I don't remember either. Definitely business news. And surprises. And surprises. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you then. <laughs>